Welcome to week 22. 22. I had to think about it for a second. <laughs> um, we're excited that you're joining us on the Bellevue Growcast. That's right. This is the Bible Reading Plan podcast. But we also will do other things from time to time on this podcast, too. So we're just excited that we're we're still going. We're still going strong. We're still reading the Bible. We're still going with the Bible Reading Plan. Continue to do it. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Is that <laughs> that's right. right? Yeah. Yeah, marathon's yeah. a slow and steady. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what right. we're doing. Dude, we're doing slow and steady. Dude, you run. How did you yeah, not I don't know that? <laughs> I, sometimes I get things backwards when I, whenever I'm talking. But let's jump right into it. For week 22, I wanted to highlight Numbers chapter 35, verses 9 through 34, and this whole idea of cities of refuge sure. or... Um, or cities for the Levites, and then cities for refuge. And it's interesting how detailed the law actually gets um, this far back. So they sure. they differentiated between murder and manslaughter. You know, we're con- sure. we're we're familiar with manslaughter, but they even differ- differentiate. I can't say that word <laughs> between manslaughter that is just a pure accident, right. like. You're, you you swing your axe up and the axe head flies off and goes back and hits somebody in the <laughs> sure. head and kills them. Yeah, that's just a pure accident, you know. Or you're you know you throw your rake up or something you you accidentally kill somebody. Or you actually you're th- you throw a rock and you, you know off a cliff and there's somebody down there and you accidentally kill them. I think that's enough examples. Yeah, I can just <laughs> end there. Yeah. Um, but there's also manslaughter that's like you break out in a fight. Right, you know, like a sudden thing yeah. or whatever, where it's not premeditated murder. Right, they call that manslaughter. Mm-hmm. And basically, the gist of this chapter is saying what to do in each of those cases. So, in the case of murder, it's obvious you're just put to death. Yeah, sure, you're just dead. But in the case of manslaughter, they have these cities of refuge where you can go to these cities of refuge. And you're safe. It's like a safe zone, yeah. you know. And if you're in these cities of refuge, then the person, the, the family of the person that you accidentally killed, can't avenge their their fallen family member's blood. Sure. Um, which is which is interesting because normally, if you so say you weren't in the city of refuge, and you accidentally killed somebody, their family could avenge their their blood, and they could kill you. Right. And that would be fine, um, even though it was an accident. So in the cities of refuge, you're safe. It's like your your home base. But um, it's only until, like, you have to stay in that city of refuge. You right. can't, if you venture out of it, then all bets are off. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. on you. Like, you, you're not safe anymore. Yeah, free world then. But check this out. Like... Even so, either like if you just purely accidentally kill somebody, or it's like a sudden fight and somebody is killed, you have to stay in the city of refuge until the priest of that city dies. Right. When the priest dies, then you can go back home, and right. and your your sin is paid for. Do you see where I'm going with this? Mm, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. It's so rich. Um, because Jesus is our high priest. Right. I tried to tra- transition like <laughs> not corny, corny <laughs> in a corny fashion, but like, I can't help it. Like all the youth pastors do, you know. Yeah. You know who else is cool? But you Jesus. Know, yeah. <laughs> I know another priest. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Dakota always is like, okay, yes, we know. Yeah, we, <laughs> we know what's coming now. But I'm like, what? It's good. Yeah. So. So like let me let me just read uh the verse the verses that this pertains to. It's verses twenty two, let's see. Yeah, starting in verse twenty two of chapter thirty five. But if he punished him suddenly without enmity, or hurled anything on him without lying in wait, or used a stone that could cause death, and without seeing him dropped it on him so that he died, though he was not his enemy and did not seek harm. Then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood in accordance with these rules. And the congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger 
and the congregation shall restore him to the city of refuge to which he had fled. And he shall live in it until the death of the high priest, who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the manslayer shall at any time go beyond the boundaries of this city of refuge to which he had fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the boundaries of the city, the avenger of blood kills the manslayer. He shall not be guilty of blood. And so that was just basically what I, what all I just described is somebody's got to pay. Sure. And we see that all through the Old Testament. When there's, where there's sin... Somebody has to pay, even though this was accidental. Right. This was a sin that wasn't premeditated. I mean, like, you could say that it was definitely a sin in the case of, like, if there was a fight breakout, then it was anger and it was a sin. But in the case of the pure accident, you know, I don't think that was necessarily a sin. But because somebody died, there had to be somebody to pay for that. Right, yeah. And it was the high priest who upon his death would atone for the the manslaughterer their actions would right. atone for it and so it's just a it's just a wonderful picture of redemption that we see you know, at the very end of numbers and kind of an odd place where you right. wouldn't think because we we see pictures of redemption we see figures of Christ all throughout the bible and this is one of them where you know, Christ is our high priest, sure. and it's upon his death that is atoned for our sin. Right. And he is our city of refuge. Mm. And right. so it's just a it's a wonderful picture of, you know, just like somebody's got to pay for our sin and our mistakes, um, and that person is Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have eternal life, and we have redemption, and we have forgiveness, and we get to, um, you know, spend eternity with Him. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's you go throughout Scripture, and it's like, hmm, God kind of knew what He was doing from the beginning. I mean, He set it all up to work together. Uh, I mean, Jesus is the same from the beginning to the end. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the same rules apply. I mean, <laughs> it, it tells us in Romans the wages of sin is what? Is death. Mm. And that's what's going to happen. And um it's, it's just crazy when you sit down and you actually read and you study, and you see how God has always been the same. He's never changed. And He was providing for them then, the same way He provides through, for us now through Jesus. So Somebody's got to pay. That's right. All right, so there you go, manslayer. Manslayer passage. All right, next, our shadow is going to be from Jonah. Um, Jonah 1, chapter 1, verse 17, if I can find it. There it is. Um, I'll just read the verse. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So we're, some of us are familiar with this story. Um, sure. You probably heard it where Jonah goes to Nineveh. Um, God wants him to... Um, preach to the Ninevites to, to repent, and he, he flees. Wait, he doesn't go to Nineveh first. No. Mm, yeah. yeah. He leaves to go to uh, Tarsus. Tarsus, yeah. yeah. And then God, you know, um, causes a great storm, right. and he's running away because he doesn't want to preach to the Ninevites, and a great storm, and he's thrown overboard, and then a fish swallows him up, and that's where we are in this verse. And so the, the the shadow of this is the whole three days and three nights. Have you ever heard any, any interpretations on this verse? Oh yeah, uh, I mean uh, Jesus says it himself, right? So just like just like Jonah went into the belly for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will go into the earth, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean he's foreshadowing his burial, just like we said a minute ago. It's like God inspired it all, right? Mm-hmm. I mean he's all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, um, what's the word? Foreshadowing. Jesus. Yeah. Shadow. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Put that together here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Foreshadow of the shadow. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Jesus offers a figural reading of this, an allegorical reading where, you know, when you read the Bible, you can read something as a as an allegory or as like a metaphor where, where something, part of the story, you know, is a symbol for something else. Sure. That's all that is. And you can read um, parts of the Bible that way, 
and read them literally at the same time, right. that's totally okay. Like, I, I believe Scripture has multi-layers oh, that absolutely. are true simultaneously, and we, we've talked about it on the podcast before, how the richness of Scripture mm. and how you can read through something one time and you're seeing this layer and this layer, <laughs> and then next time you read it, you're seeing this other these other two, two layers down here. And so I believe that that's true of this verse right here. I, I do believe that, you know, this, you know, Jesus you know, goes back and grabs this this three days and three nights to, um, you know, to identify with, um, to, to identify with, like, the whole death aspect of, you know, Jonah going into the sea, because in the Old Testament, the sea was seen as chaos. Sure. It was a very chaos and scary place, and where, where Jesus went, he went to death, he went to the grave and conquered death. And death is a very chaotic and scary place. It's it's the greatest enemy of of humanity is right. death. Mm-hmm. And so the, you see Jesus reaching back and, and showing and giving a a an allegorical understanding of Jonah's three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. And it it also has this. There's a in in Near Eastern literature. Three days and three nights can also stand for going to Hades, going mm-hmm. to the dead, or going to the realm of the dead. Even in even in like non-Jewish, non-Christian religions, right? It has this same like three days and three nights. That time period is used in other secular literature. Um, I don't now. I do not think that it means that Jonah died. Yeah, no. and then Ray mm-hmm. was raised to life. But I do think that it was just a a way for um, the text to point to Jesus three days um, or three three days that he was you know dead before he was raised to life. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and there's so much that's that's just good. I mean, like you said a minute ago, rich in the story of Jonah and. I mean, it's only four chapters, and it's really small. I mean, my Bible it fits on two pages, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, mine's there, just two pages. There's there's something, or there's so much you can unpack there. And I think so many times we we look at this story, and um, like you said a minute ago, people are like, "Oh, well, he wasn't really in a big fish." Well, you think the God who hung the universe, and I mean, literally created it all, couldn't sustain a man in the belly of a fish mm-hmm. for three days if he wanted to? Yeah. Uh, but we oftentimes think about Jonah, and we think. How could you be uh, so stupid? You're a prophet of God, and uh, how could you be so stupid to try to run from him? Well, I mean, he hated the Assyrians. Like, mm. he, he couldn't stand them. Hated them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they were people that would slaughter pregnant women just to watch the babies fall out. Like, you, yeah, you could imagine the Assyrians were like terrorists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and they had wreaked havoc on the Israelites. Of course, mm-hmm. Jonah didn't like them. Mm-hmm. If we were in the same position, we would have too. Um, and we, we talked about a little bit about this earlier, uh, but I love what he says in chapter 4 and verse 2, where he said, uh, he says this, he said, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, uh, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? Uh, that is why I made haste to go to Tarshish, for I knew that you are gracious and merciful God. Like, hmm. it's so he was gracious. God, I mean, Jonah knew he had grace and mercy, and that's why you go back to him being in the belly of the well, that Jonah knew he could turn to him because he knew that God was all about grace and mercy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then foreshadow that to Jesus, to the people who are literally screaming, crucify him and hanging him on the cross. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Mm. And we we would look at, at Jonah and say, he's dumb. And if we're in our real like life application, a lot of times we say, how could you do that, Jesus, when that's how Jesus wants us to act? And it's just wild to me sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's like Jonah in chapter four. He's saying he's he's making a charge against God. Yeah. Like you're gracious and merciful. You know, I knew you were. Yeah. You know, like it's a negative thing. Right. You know, and um, you know, it's funny that he knew that of God, and he knew that the possibility of God letting or relenting mm-hmm. His anger against the the Ninevite the Ninevites was was going to happen. 
but yet he's still angry about it, you know, um, and he makes a charge against God. Usually when you make a charge against somebody, it's it's they did something bad. It's negative, yeah. <laughs> but that just shows that Jonah's heart posture um, has really kind of gone back to the old Jonah that yeah. the story begins with, and that's of, you know, wanting to run away from God. And um, But, yeah, and, and the Lord rebukes him, you know, through right. the whole appointing the worm and the tree and uses that as a teaching moment to, to say, like, these are these are real people that I love and created, the right. Ninevites, but yet, you know, you're more worried about this plant, you yeah. know, and, and but yet um, we we do the same thing as far as uh, we, de- we devalue human life all the time and we judge people and we don't want God's best for people that we don't like also. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. I believe you have our application. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this week we're in uh, Psalm 91 through 94. Um, if you kind of go and you and you read all of them, there's kind of this overarching theme of, like, the Lord is supreme and He's, like, in control of everything. But uh, I really wanted to focus on, on Psalm 93. Um, it's only five verses, really <laughs> short. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is what it says. I'll read the whole thing because it won't take yeah. just a second. It says, The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is put uh, on strength at his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. uh, Mightier than the thunders of the waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are trustworthy. Holiness benefits from your house, O Lord, forevermore. Uh, and so the psalmist is just saying that God is He's mighty. He's in control. He's the one that established everything, that uh, He's different than all of us. He's, mm-hmm. ev- he's eternal. He's everlasting. He is, he is the creator. He's not a created one like we are. Um, but really what caught my eye is in verse 5, um, he says, it says, your decrees are very trustworthy, or uh, your testimonies are very trustworthy. And then it says, holiness benefits from your ha- or holiness benefits your house, mm. or the CSB says, uh, it adorns your house. Mm. Uh, and so you go and you, you look up uh, the Hebrew word, and I looked it up, and I listened to it, and I will not try to say it, because... Something with a... Yeah, 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 not yeah. even... No. Barely speak English, good. You know what I mean. <laughs> uh, but but when you look it up, um, it's got two meanings. It, it means to literally be uh, to be at home there. It also means to make something beautiful. Hmm. So uh, I think we can really take two things away from that. Is number one, God's holiness is beautiful. Hmm. Like it's beautiful to yeah. look upon because we see that whatever decision that God makes, uh, and you go back in Psalm. Uh, 92, and, and the psalmist talks about how wonderful his works are and how good God is and the things he does and that he's righteous and everything, that because God is holy, we know that he has his best interest and our best interest at heart. Mm. And if we're following him and his best interest, it'll be the best thing for us, Ooh, that, it, yeah. that, it's, that it's the best thing that could ever happen to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we can say that it's beautiful that God is holy, that mm. he's just and he's righteous and that he is... He's God, right? Mm-hmm. But also, it gives us assurance to know that we serve a good God mm. because holiness is at home with Him. Like, mm. they go hand in hand. Yeah. Like, yeah. there's there's no part of God that's not holy. Right. Like, He's completely holy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something that we can never be. Yeah. Uh, and then it just points, I think, back to Jesus because mm. Jesus is the only one that could be holy. Like, mm-hmm. we couldn't do it. Yeah, uh, and he came to be our salvation to to pay the price we never could. Mm. Um, and mm. so it's just thinking about him being holy. Uh, I'll be honest; I think it's been like a theme in my life for the past couple of years. I mean, Jesus says it over and over in the Sermon on the Mount: "Be holy." It says it in Leviticus. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago in youth. Peter says it. Mm. He says, "Be holy, for your Father in heaven is holy." Like, yeah, that's what God wants us to do. Yeah, is be holy, be like Him. And to know that God is holy hmm. and that holiness lives in his house. I mean, that's just, I think it's just wonderful. Going off script here. Yeah. But, and I know we're, you know, at our time, but I like 
what you're saying about holiness. Do we do you think we as Christians sometimes as believers see that, you know, this is the standard that God has set, his mm-hmm. holiness, and this is, you know, we're called to to be holy. Do you think that we sometimes are like, well, I'll never get there. I'm just a, a sinner saved by grace and you know, like nobody can actually be perfect and be holy. So like do you think we kind of like we kind of like talk ourselves out of that of that standard? Oh, you know? absolutely. All the time. I mean, what does uh, what does Paul say in Romans? He says, "Does that mean that we should just sin so grace abounds?" Right. He yeah. says, "Absolutely not." Right. And my favorite analogy to use about this is uh, the woman caught in adultery. Right. Mm, say yeah. that. Say this every time that I talk about this. First off, where's the dude? Takes two to tango. Takes he two was t- he was <laughs> he was just as much adultery. Was, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they bring the woman, and I saw this great quote the other day. The only one who was able to throw a stone told the rest of them to put it down. Ooh, yeah. I was, I mean, I was that's like, right. that's a good one. Yeah. But after they're all gone and it's just her and Jesus, right, does he say, hey, go ahead and go sin. It's okay because I'm going to pay for your sin. Yeah. No, he says, go and sin no sin more. Sin no more. He says, he says, don't go do it. Yeah. Try your best to stay away from that lifestyle. That's the standard he set forth. Mm-hmm. But we're assured in Scripture that he's our high priest that advocates for us mm. because God knows that we're not going to get it right. Yeah, We're going to mess up. We're going to fail. Whether it's a hundred times, whether it's just one more time, whether mm-hmm. it's a million times, mm. we're going to mess up. Yeah, uh, And and Jesus says he's going to forgive us, but he still gives us a standard to do it. Uh, I mean, Peter says it, I think, best. He says, be like obedient children. Like when we go and look at our kids – like we know they're gonna mess up, but we want them to do right. We we tell them to do the right things so that it benefits them. Mm-hmm. It it's not just about like the purpose is to show God's glory, but it's also to benefit our kids. Yeah. Like and it's yeah. the same way with God. Like He knows that the things that He tells us to do are what's enriching for our life. Like it's what is good for us. He tells us not to lie. Not only because it makes him look bad if we say that we're believers, but also because we know that if we lie, or he knows that if we lie, we're going to damage all the relationships that are around us. Mm-hmm. We're going to destroy everything around us. And that's a silly example, but mm-hmm. like with everything, God has our best interest at heart, just as much as His holiness and His goodness. Mm. So, yeah. Since we're already over time, yeah. So, like, we have God's holy holiness, and like who God says we are mm. up here, right? right. But then we have where we where we live down here. It's mm. like where I'm at. Yeah. We have where I'm at and who where God says I am, which is, you know, I'm seen as righteous. Uh, mm. You know, Jesus' blood has covered my whole all of my sins. And when God looks down on me, He sees Jesus' perfect righteousness. Sure. So that disconnect the the line from where we are to where God says we are in His holy, you know. Perfection, um, his holy standard up here. That line is the sanctification process, right. yeah. and that that's the whole point. And it's God's love for us is not based on us achieving the perfection because He did it for us already. Yeah. Not that not that it's not something we could do anyway. Right. But the beauty of His holiness. Getting back to the text, the beauty of His holiness is. Because of that standard and because he went and did it for us, because of his love for us, God can't like love us any more. Like if we mm. never if we never go up any more that like from where we are to where God's standard is, like if we never inch up towards that any more than we are today, he doesn't love us any less. Mm. Right. And that is just amazing. It is to think about I mean, when you think about the worst people in history, like, I mean, you think about just off, like, the first one always comes to mind is Hitler. I mean, mm-hmm. kills all, I mean, millions and millions of people. God loves him just as much as he loves me. And when we think of other people in that aspect, mm-hmm. it makes us say, well, the petty arguments that we get into and that we can't stand people, it kind of puts that kind of stuff like, hey, you just need to throw that in the trash. That's bad. Because mm-hmm. God loves him just as much. And, you know, I was we, going back to to not how do I say this? Going back to uh, what you're saying about just 
sin and oh, grace covers it. Scripture talks about over and over how our salvation should be evident through the things that happen. Uh, like you look at Zacchaeus, mm-hmm. and you can tell his salvation happened because he immediately turns around, probably one of the richest men around, mm-hmm. and says, "I'll repay anybody fourfold." Wow! And yeah. if and if he took all this money from me, but he's going to give you back fourfold, that means he's going to have to work it off. Mm-hmm. It's not just, hey, I'm going to give you back what I took. Mm-hmm. I'm going to work myself to give it back. And so like, we've got to be careful and make sure that our lives are evident of our salvation. And if they're mm-hmm. not, then we need to really check ourselves. Yeah, uh, And that goes for everybody. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you've been going to church for a day or you've been going to church for 40 years. <laughs> I mean, you've got to check yourself and make sure – that number one, you haven't gone stagnant. Number two, you have that relationship. Mm. Yeah, because you should be wanting to, like you said, to always be to to be going up. I mean, yeah, we'll only reach there when we get to heaven. Yeah, but it's our job to to continue to strive to that. Mm. So. That's good. Yeah, sorry to get us off on a tangent, <laughs> but there we go. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, thanks, MJ, for yes, doing this with with me, and that was a that was a good one. Yeah, it was a. It was good for me to hear what what you were talking about with the beauty of His holiness it ministered to me. And um, so we will see you guys. Keep reading. We'll see you guys next week. See you.